Yeah, I mentioned you to get that going a little earlier, but it doesn't matter. We'll play a little. Uh, oh, keep it going. It is going? Yeah, keep it going. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Wednesday, I think. <laughs> They're all running, blurring together for me. I'm sure they are for you as well. Um, we're uh, playing a little Green Day this morning. Um, uh, you may know or you may not know, uh, Green Day is a local band, uh, Berkeley. In fact, um, Billy Joe uh, still li uh, he lives up in the Oakland Hills, uh, that way somewhere, and uh, has one house there. I'm sure he's a, I'm sure he's a gazillionaire. Probably his house is all over the place. Um, but uh, uh, they started here. They played their first concert, first live gig uh, at the uh, uh, there's a little little dive uh, bar called the the Caning Shop. It used to be a it used to be a where they made canes, I guess. Um, they kept the name, uh, played down there. Some people got lucky and saw Green Day in, a, in an intimate venue before they went huge. Um, for you guys, uh, this is an old song um, uh, in the before times. <laughs> this song was popular when I first started teaching at Cal. Um, so that is in 2000. Um, so uh, right when you guys yeah most of you 90 percent of you out there uh not on the earth yet um so uh but it has a minor connection to what we're going to talk about uh today um and along the same theme that we've been saying uh we love the songs we like to sing around along but we often don't understand the words uh it's like chem one you love the quantum mechanics it's a catchy tune you want to sing along <laughs> but it can't quite follow the words uh, how's the glare on the board? Is that uh, window bothering us there? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, you can bring that, uh, fade that, uh, volume or just, Ooh, <laughs> Andrew, impressive. You can fade the volume. I thought you were going to just hit pause. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay. So we have been talking about, uh, quantum mechanics. And we've been doing it in a, a very simple way in one dimension. And it's easy to talk about in one dimension because uh, the wave functions are so easy to visualize. They're just these sine waves, and they're so easy to understand. You can see how they would add and subtract and give you constructive and destructive interference. You see where the nodes are, the places where the wave function goes to zero. It's very visual, it's very neat and compact, and you can actually solve, we kind of did that, we solved the wave equation. So uh, you may have heard the term the Schrodinger equation for the quantum mechanical description of uh, electrons, uh, matter. And uh, that, essentially we solved that in one dimension when we came to those uh, sine waves. Um, and it's a, it's a straightforward differential equation. It's a, a second order linear differential equation if you uh, write it out. And many of you will go on and solve those in uh, math classes coming up here in your next uh, semester or two. So, um, and it might be a good time to point out, we've also been saying that the wave equations, the sines and cosines, and the fact that all the things we've been talking about, the, the uh, wave behavior, the uncertainty principle, uh, adding and subtracting nodes, dark spots, light spots, that's all true for any kind of wave. And the solutions were understood, even to the mathematics, well before quantum mechanics uh, arose. What happened was, as I think we've in intimated before, uh, there was this idea that matter could behave like a wave. And then the first experiments, and we looked at one of the first happy accidents that said, oh yeah, this electron is showing wave-like properties. It looks like a de Broglie wavelength. It was exactly a de Broglie wavelength. People were amazed. But people also said, oh, well, if it behaves like a wave, we have all this mathematics already for waves. Let's just start applying it to matter and see what happens. And every, most people were skeptical. They said, oh, it's behaving like a wave, but I bet if you do all the wave equations, I bet you're not going to see you know, this prediction of wave equations. Like, you're not going to see the uncertainty principle uh, arise for matter. 
you're, you should know where matter is. Uh, you're not going to see probabilities for matter. That doesn't make sense. Uh, Einstein was famously opposed to quantum mechanics. Uh, he's, you may have heard the famous quote, uh, God does not play dice with the universe. <laughs> he said, you don't roll the dice to see where the electrons are. It's not a probabilistic thing. You should know where the electron is. And he did experiments to try to disprove. You, he, one of them was the, the uncertainty principle. Um, that kind of experiment where you narrow the gaps and get a broader distribution. He tried to do that with matter to in to show that it wasn't uh, really behaving probabilistically, but it turns out it was. And every experiment since then has agreed with mathematics. And the crazy thing is the mathematics was all worked out. In fact, all worked out in the 1800s, 1700s. So the solutions to these differential equations, these wave equations, psi squared, the different, uh, all that worked out abstractly, the mathematics, even before it was, they understood waves in particular. So that mathematics was done. So all you had to do when you got to quantum mechanics really was get the physical constants and the physical situation right. And then you solve these wave equations and you literally could go to a book and look them up. And uh, from the 1700s. <laughs> and they worked. The matter did that stuff. And that is, is crazy almost. Um, it's a philosophical question and you should think about it sometime when you're not thinking about <laughs> the science. But the fact that if, if you ask me, you know, what, what's the scientific question that you ponder a lot and, you know, keeps you up at night or whatever? It's kind of that. Why? There's no reason that the universe has to follow our mathematics. We're in the universe and it's a construct of us, uh, but the universe is gigantic and indifferent to us. We came up with this mathematics and it describes the universe <laughs> and some of it we came up before we even understood the universe and it still worked. Uh, there's no real reason that it, it, it should predict reality, but it seems to do that. And the question arises, well, does that blind us? We, we have this thing that works and it's predicting reality. We don't understand the whole universe though, is it because our mathematics is like a blinder? It's limiting us from seeing the whole thing. Um, anyway, it's it's uh, it's crazy. There, there's no reason math should work fundamentally, philosophically, but it does. So let's look at it. We've done it in one dimension. Now let's look at it in two dimensions. So you can have standing waves in two dimensions, and you know that that's the surface of of a pond or the the ocean. Waves standing, interfering. And if you put boundaries on those waves, you bound them in a pond, they will have standing waves and they will have specific standing waves that fit in the pond or on the surface of a drum. That's a tight surface that's gonna vibrate and it will have standing waves just like the plucked string. And I think you probably understand what some of them look like. So here's the drum maybe situation, surface of a drum. There is the ground state frequency and it's oscillating up and down it's doing its sinusoidal has a frequency uh that describes its motion and we have two dimensions though and instead of one quantum number we're going to pick up a quantum number for every dimension so matter will be quantized in every dimension you could say the more dimensions we have the more quantum numbers we have and we'll keep track of that. So we'll go up to three quantum numbers because we have three physical dimensions. So we're going to call the, the second one L. So N we're going to keep and L is the second one. So uh, here, this state, rather than being described by one quantum number, is described by two, N and L. N equals one, L equals zero in that case. And it has no nodes in it. And the nodes are a little harder to see. But here you see the second uh, vibration, an equal two. 
the second frequency that fits. And now you can see a node because this thing is going from plus to minus here and it's changing sign in the uh, surface of the drum. So that's a two zero, but as N gets bigger, L can get bigger. So uh, the size of L, the second quantum number is limited by N, but it can get bigger. So we can have one node here uh, and you can see, I've kind of tried to draw it. There's a, a radial node there, that surface of that, uh, uh, line there is where the wave function keeps crossing zero, going from positive to negative. Uh, here's another way that that can vibrate. And now you see why, oh, I go to more dimensions. I need more quantum numbers because if it were the string, we just have this one and this one, n equal one, n equal two, but there's different ways you can vibrate and uh, oscillate in more dimensions. So you have to keep track of that. And that's what the L quantum number does. So this is L equals one. So L is limited uh, by uh, how big N is. So L won't get bigger than N. So in this case, you had zero and one. And L can also have the value zero. And we said uh, could not. So here you have kind of a line that is your uh, node. And you can keep going. Uh, so here we have the three wave functions for n equals three. And we'll label them with their, their uh, pairs of quantum numbers, three, zero, three, one, and three, two. Uh, there are many more modes, uh, it turns out. Um, we're not going to get too complicated here. But again, uh, we should point out that N still gives you the total energy. So this energy level for N equal one, this energy level for uh, N equal two, even though there are two modes here, they both have the same energy because they both have the same N. So these are called degenerate. That means of the same energy. I'll say that word a lot. These are degenerate modes. There are three degenerate modes all have the same energy when n equals three in this case and they have different combinations of nodes so here you have uh those radial nodes a combination of radial and linear nodes and two kind of linear nodes there at the end um it's useful to actually look at this one uh in a demo simply because it gives us this opportunity so I will bring this up, and uh, that's as big as I can get it, I guess. So we'll look at it here. And so here I've brought up, and we can go just to the uh, screen so you can uh, see this close up in high resolution. Uh, I bring this up, and this already looks like the, the mode we had uh, when we got to n equal 2, and we had this node. But now you can see the node a little better. And I wanted to indicate here, see how this red and green are oscillating back and forth? That's indicating the phase. You see, when, when you're on the positive side, you're green. When you're on the negative side, you're red. So that's the phase, whether you're positive or negative. That's indicating the sign of the wave function. And here, the sign of the wave function is obvious because it's negative there, positive there. We're looking at the wave function. But we're going to keep those colors when we square the wave function. So if I pause this, I don't know if I can pause it. Um, <laughs> let's see. Frequency based damping simulation speed. What if I just make the simulation speed quite low? Oh yeah, I can make the simulation speed so low that I pause it. So uh, come back to me for a minute on the camera. So here I've made the simulation speed so low that it's that it stopped oscillating. But you can see the wave function is positive here, negative here. It's slowly going to oscillate back. If you took the square of the wave function, though, and you can stay on me for this, the square will have...
that kind of profile because you square that negative number and you'll get positive numbers. That's why we do it. Remember, we need a, a magnitude to get the probability of finding particles. If this were a, a particle spread out in two dimensions, and that's the crazy thing about the electron. It can spread out in two dimensions. It doesn't have to be a bead on a string. It can be uh, a bead on a surface. So it's spread out, but you have to use the square of the wave function to do that. But you can't tell once you square it where the wave function itself, psi, not psi squared, was positive or negative. So we just retain the shading. We'll, we'll draw the wave function squared but we'll shade one side green and one side red to remind you that this was positive and this, not gonna be able to see that, was negative before you squared the wave function. So the color represents the phase. Uh, we do that all the time. And when we get to three dimensions, it gets more important. Uh, here it's still pretty clear to see, but you can see that it will get, it could get complicated fast. So that's two uh, dimensions, and there they are all vibrating together, two quantum numbers. Um, and again, the more nodes correspond to higher energy: the zero node situation, the two node situation, and the three node situation. Degenerate uh, energy levels for n one, n two, n equals three and the various values of L consistent with more nodes. So let's go and do this now for three dimensions. And now we're in the situation where we are gonna say the electron is trapped. So it's a electron trapped in a potential energy well because it's attracted to the positive nucleus. So what's trapping it is a potential well, needs a lot of energy to get out of that. The electrons that have less kinetic energy, so this is, I'm gonna um, plot uh, energy here. So these are the uh, low energy states and these are the high energy states. If I have a, kinetic energy that's less than this potential difference, then I'm trapped in there. I can't get out. And there's lots of electrons that are trapped in there. So they're behaving like a wave and they are have boundaries. So that means these electrons will assume standing waves of quantized energy, just like in one dimension. The trouble is the wave functions now are a little hard to visualize because they are three-dimensional uh, uh, wave functions. But again, believe it or not, they were solved. The functional form of them was known in, I, I can't remember the day. We should, we should look it up and see. Uh, someone <laughs> Google uh, who uh, first solution uh, for the sphere, first derivation of spherical harmonics. Uh, see if <laughs> in three dimensions. <laughs> I don't know when that is. I'm going to guess 1790s ish. Whoa, 1782. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. That's right from our research department. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to operate in three dimensions here. And so I need three coordinates. And X, Y, and Z turn out to be cumbersome now. Um, so I'm going to use spherical polar coordinates, still three of them, but just, and they'll describe a point in space, but instead of giving you, um, the X, Y, and, uh, Z, the coordinates X, Y, Z to get to this point, I'm going to give you, uh, two angles and a radius. So let's look at how that would work. So. I'm going to use spherical polar coordinates. So my functions, wave functions, will be functions of r, theta, and phi, a radius and two angles. And the psi squared will still be the probability now of finding electrons in that region. And here's how they look. So you have a positively charged nucleus, 
trapping an electron around it, just like very similar to the uh, Earth being trapped by the sun. Uh, but in this case, crazy because the, there's no orbits. There's no circulating of electrons. They're just spread out in these crazy standing wave patterns all over the place. And the probability of finding them is all over the place. Some high probabilities, some low probabilities we've seen going by the square of these wave functions. I haven't drawn them yet. We'll do that in a minute. First, let's get our, our coordinates. So we're going to use R. That's the distance from the origin. In this case, the distance from the nucleus. That's one of our coordinates. The other coordinate will be theta, the angle of R from the positive z-axis, and phi, the angle of R, the projection in the xy plane of R, from the positive x-axis. OK? So uh, you don't have to grapple with these too much. We're gonna we're gonna do a chem quiz or two that has us think through the implications of r theta and phi, but we're not gonna delve deeply into the functional form of these uh, wave functions. But you need to speak the same language again. So we're gonna write these in terms of r theta and phi. And again, it, we do it simply as a matter of convenience. If you write the differential equation in terms of r theta and phi. The it's a beautiful you, you can see already it's a beautiful uh, a spherical set of coordinates that fit a sphere quite well where x y and z don't really fit a sphere well so the equations are easy to solve in this coordinate system so we change coordinate systems so uh, we'll end up with three quantum numbers because we have three dimensions. We'll still use n, l, and now we'll add a third, m sub l. They'll depend on each other. L will depend on n, and m sub l will depend on l. Here's what they will determine. The principal quantum number, that's n, the first one. It can have integer values just like it did, and they, they come from the same argument you did in the one-dimensional string that you plucked. But they will corresponds to an orbital property. So I'm going to start using this term orbital. And orbital is just the wave function squared. We call it an orbital because now we're going to talk about the regions of probability where electrons can exist. And those regions of probability we call orbitals. So there's going to be many orbitals, and they'll be described. We're not going to write the size down anymore. That's too complicated. Instead, we'll kind of do this picture thing that we just did with the two dimensions. We'll just give you the set of quantum numbers. And each set of three quantum numbers describes one of the wave functions. We're not going to write it down. We'll do a, the mathematics. We'll do a look at a picture. So here is the principal quantum number. It gives you still the total energy of the system, just like it did before. And it limits the number of nodes. So the number of nodes is n minus 1. You have as many nodes uh, as n minus 1. So when you're n equal 1, you have zero nodes. And we've seen that already. There are no nodes in that first fundamental frequency. L, often called the angular momentum quantum number. I don't think I'll use that term very often. Uh, I'll probably just say L. And it has values that depend on n. And it just goes, it just goes in integer steps, one, two, three, four, uh, excuse me, zero, one, two, three, four. Importantly, it starts at zero. It starts at zero and it goes up to n minus one. So if n is one, L can only be zero because n minus one is zero. But if n is three, then you can go zero, one, two, up to n minus one. We have uh, this angular momentum will tell us something about, we'll associate it strongly with the shape, the three-dimensional shape of the orbital. So we'll have spherical orbitals, we'll have dumbbell orbitals, and L will kind of tell us where we are shape-wise. They can have the same energy, different shape. We saw that already with the two dimensions. So L will tell us, just kind of like it did with the two dimensions, it'll tell us which vibrational mode of the same energy we're in. 
And then there's the third, we'll call that the magnetic quantum number. I don't think I'll use that term uh, very much either. I will just say M sub L. And it can have values depending on L. And these are a little more confusing, but they go from the negative value of L up in integer steps to the positive value of L. So if L is two, you'd go minus two, minus one, zero, one, two for the values of M sub L. So lots of M sub Ls for your, uh, for every L. And this is gonna tell you something about the orientation of the shapes. Cause you know, if you have kind of a, a shape in three dimensions that has this kind of phase, it could be doing this, but it could also be doing this. And so that orientation is uh, something that M sub L will tell us. <clears throat> so how do the energies look? And we know the energies depend on the principal quantum num number. Same thing. We're not going to derive this, but it turns out to be simple for one electron and one nucleus. So a two particle system. <clears throat> if you have one electron, this you can solve these equations exactly. It's beautiful. In fact, the equations are so good, this quantum mechanics describes hydrogen, one proton, one electron, so perfectly that we have not been able to do an experiment yet that deviates from this. There's no other that I know of, no other mathematical formulation, no other theory that is this perfect in science. It's an exact description of one proton and one electron. Unfrickin' believable. You can go to as many, so you can, the, way, the way you would test it is you'd measure the energy levels. You can do that. And back in the old days, you couldn't measure them very accurately. But we always said, well, experiment is the real number, and theory is just uh, you know, something that's trying to get us there. But as, as technology progressed and you got more and more decimal places, more and more precision in your energy, it always lined up exactly with the theory. Just spectacular triumph. Um, but again, does that blind us from <laughs> something else that might be there? Who knows? So it goes as Z. And remember, this is already a couple of weeks ago. But Z is the charge on the nucleus. <clears throat> so for hydrogen, that's one. For helium, that's two. It's got a negative sign. Z squared over the <coughs> quantum number squared times an, a new constant, the Rydberg constant. And here it is in three different flavors. Uh, you could write it down in joules, which we'll do most of the time. Uh, there it is in hertz. And here it is in uh, per mole. So those values you'll have to keep track of, but it's just a constant. And you know, on the exam, I'm probably not going to have you plug in that constant. I'm just going to have you give me things in terms of R so you don't have to do math and numbers. You'll have to do some math and numbers. I'll put some numbers on there. It, it helps. Doing the math and numbers does help. I, I absolutely agree. So, And you do that in your homework. It's why you do it in your homework. This tends to make more sense sometimes if you plug in the numbers. So. Uh, how do we write them? Here's my energy level diagram. N equal one is my ground state, and it has energy minus R uh, minus one Rydberg, because we're doing a hydrogen atom. We're doing a one charge in the nucleus. That's one squared is still one over one is one times R minus is the ground state energy. And go to, it's a quarter of a Rydberg. You can do that math quickly. Still one, Z still one. So it's just N that's going to change here. So it's two squared, quarter of a Rydberg. Then on up as N gets bigger. So three, a ninth, uh, four, a sixteenth. And in this case, and we already alluded to this, we're going to call we're going to put zero up here so all these energies are negative they're all below zero 
you're still going to higher energy and we still write it higher energy on the board. It just happens they're all, we all just make them negative numbers. And that again is virtually mathematical convenience. Almost, there's almost no other reason uh, to do that. But again, what we're interested in is the spacings anyway. So it doesn't really matter what zero is, but we set zero at the ionized state. And we've talked about this already before. If you're trapped in that potential well, the electron and the uh, proton are attracted to each other. I'm going to pull them apart. So I'm putting energy in. So the energy of the system, electron proton is the system, that's increasing because I'm pulling them apart. So I'm going to higher energy. And I say the zero, though, is all the way apart infinitely separated, the fully ionized state. So we can call that number zero and scale everything relative to that. It's OK to call put zero at your at your maximum. OK, but compare and contrast now. So here I've drawn the energy going down here because it's uh, uh, this is the zero in energy, and I'm going down. And I just wanted to compare and contrast. When we did the the uh, particle in a box, the one-dimensional box situation, then zero in energy was uh, zero energy, the lowest energy state. Uh, not not there's zero in energy was below the ground state, as you know. The ground state had more than zero energy, but we put the zero below that. So these had positive energies, and we went up. But again, what we're interested in is differences. That's a difference, and that's a difference. That's all we need to know. So let's do a chem quiz. Uh, to which ion? So now I have hydrogen, I have helium, and I have lithium. So you can have a periodic table, but this I'll give you um, uh, the uh, the uh, um, atomic number. So hydrogen is, oops, sorry. I have to put uh, here. Oh, for goodness sakes. Pen, please. Uh, here we have Z charge on the nucleus one. Here, two protons charge on the nucleus two. Here, three protons charge on the nucleus three. Okay, so let's start the oh, where'd it go? Okay. We've started the uh, uh, counter, so go ahead, talk about it, and take a vote.
Okay. Uh, we got a lot of uh, responses there, so let's come back together and see what you're thinking. You got to see um, Sophia and I, who are in the in the studio. You got to see us thinking as we scribbled on the board. Uh, actually, this is kind of fun. Uh, if you get a chance, I've said this before. If you get a chance, come in. <laughs> we'll scribble on the board uh, together. Um, so let's see what uh, you voted here. Uh, many of us think helium plus. Uh, that's the second answer here. And I agree with those helium pluses. Why is that? Well, uh, it, look at the diagram and, and you've got to do some struggling here. What is this diagram? This is an energy level diagram. Here, energy increasing and E uh, sub N is the energy level. E sub N looks like minus Z squared over N squared times R. Okay, R is a constant. Z and N change. Z is the charge on the nucleus. N is just a counting number. It's just, just the uh, one, two, three, four principal quantum number. And we already determined this energy level here for hydrogen had energy minus R because Z is one for hydrogen and N is one. So minus R. This species, it's one of these, the energy of the second level, N equals two is minus R. Well, that gives you all the information you know because to get that energy level, I've got to put two, that looks like a Z, two in there, second principal quantum level. But the energy has to be minus R. So Z has to be two. So the charge on the nucleus here must be two. And that's helium. These are one electron systems. I hope you noticed that. He plus has one electron because it started out with two and two protons. You took away one and the whole thing is charged. Same thing here. You've taken away two electrons from the three <laughs> that lithium Z plus three had. Okay. So Sophia had a great question. When we were saying, she said, well, what that? Oh, it bothered her a lot that this was down here. And I admit, it looks like the difference, so you want to focus on it. But it doesn't have any helpful information in it right away because we didn't give you this energy. But now you know what it is because you know it's just Z squared over 1 squared. And what is Z squared if Z is 2? 4. So this energy is, I'll even put it in green because all the rest of them are green, minus 4 R. Okay? And that should make some intuitive sense to you. And why should it make some intuitive sense? Because for hydrogen, you have one positive charge attracting, attack, attracting the nucleus. If you have two positive charges attract, I think I said that wrong. One positive charge in the nucleus pulling on the electron. For helium, two positive charges pulling on the electron. That every energy state, the lowest energy state, is going to be lower in energy because that is a bigger energy interaction. It's going to take you more to pull that off. So you had to start out lower. And it's not twice as big there's two pluses and a minus it goes as the square of the charge cool there's a lot of good information in there i probably uh do the uh, math here so i'll put that up on the board because it's neater than mine and you can take a screenshot if you want and that's it 
Uh, let's talk through this one together. Which transition in helium plus has the same wavelength as two to one in hydrogen? So now we're talking about a uh, wavelength. I, we don't say if it's an absorption or an emission. Oh, we do say it's an emission. I go from two to one and I emit a photon of light and I emit a photon of light with that much delta E, that much energy. I go from two to one and out comes a photon. What is the wavelength of that photon? Well, it's this is a straightforward calculation. Here is two to one in hydrogen. And we know uh, here's four to two. I've written uh, two to one overlapping with four to two. Uh, y, that spacing is the same. Um, I think the question said, if you were talking about helium, what has the same wavelength? Uh, let me go to the question. <laughs> Helps to remember what the question is. Yeah. If Z is bigger, HE plus has Z equals two, which has the same wavelength, which has the same energy level spacing in helium as hydrogen's two to one spacing? So you have to look at hydrogen's two to one spacing. Hydrogen's two to one spacing is this big. It turns out we just saw in the previous chem quiz that lines up with the four and the two energy levels in helium. Why does it line up with the one, two spacing lines up with two, four in helium? Because Z is two. So you get that bigger energy. So this spacing, one to two in hydrogen, is the same spacing as two, four in helium. One, two in helium is much bigger. That helium, that goes down to minus four. These are the energies for um, for hydrogen. In fact, that makes it less clear. I'll just take those off. This we're saying is helium over here. This is hydrogen. So this level here is minus R. This is minus 4R. But the two, uh, four overlap. So you can see that four to two is the same spacing. So it's a different atom, but it's going to emit the same wavelength in one of its emissions because one of the spacings is the same. Okay, so let's continue looking at the shapes of these guys. So uh, to get to a full wave function, I have to give you three quantum numbers. And that's how we're going to uh, describe our wave functions. We're not going to write down the mathematical sines and cosines and uh, um, e to the pi phi theta, all that stuff. We're not going to do any of that. We're just going to give you a set of three and you come up with what that general shape is. So you get a picture of the wave function from every set of three. So here's a set. N equal one, L equals zero, M sub L equals zero. That's possible. What does that look like? Well, it turns out that has spherical symmetry. This is the classic, ah, uh, it's a, it looks like an atom. Uh, uh, spherical, no nodes. So there's just this probability distribution, spherical probability distribution around the nucleus. It's pleasing, it looks like an atom. And we calculate where the electron is based on the intent, the uh, amplitude of the wave function squared. This is the wave function, not the wave function squared. We often show you, though, the wave function squared in these pictures. And then we have to use that shading, red and green or blue and whatever, two shadings to tell you, well, the wave function changed sign there. We're showing you the square of it. So here, <clears throat> psi squared. Doesn't matter in this case because there's no nodes. N equal two, I can also have L equals zero, but I can also have L equal one now because N got one bigger and M sub L equals zero. 
Now I have the same spherical distribution, but one node, and it's a radial node. So the wave function goes from positive to negative, and I didn't do the, the shading of color there. I'll do it uh, next time. In fact, we'll do it in our demo right now. Uh, the shading would change inside on this side of the node to that side of the node because the sign of the wave function changes from positive to negative. Now we're going to throw one one wrench in the works, and I've already you've already seen it, and I haven't said it out loud. The values of L, we're not going to give. We're gonna we're gonna give each value of L a letter designation, and that for you, as far as you guys are concerned, that's just a that's just a more a confusing step. It's arbitrary. We're gonna give L number values. We're gonna use almost exclusively. We're gonna use letters for the value of L, and there's no rhyme or reason to them. You just gotta memorize them. I hate stuff that you have to memorize, but this is one of those things. The value of L, we're going to give the letter S. L0 is going to be letter S. So when I write this orbital designation, 1 is the principal quantum level. S is the value of L. And it's 0. So 1S, L equal 1. Now, I should also have a little sub zero there because m sub l is zero don't write it because it's the only value m sub l can have if l is zero so it's it's uh kind of superfluous information okay let's look at let's go a little farther and we'll look at the picture i can go when n equals two now i have a possible i still have l equals zero we saw that the 2s orbital, but now 2 and l equals 1, and we're going to give this letter p for the value of l equal 1. Again, completely arbitrary. <laughs> you just got to memorize. l equals 1 is a p. And I have two values of, uh, well, I have three values of m sub l. Uh, they are minus l, 0, and plus l. So here's what the orbitals look like, and I've drawn two of them to start with. I've kind of drawn the plus and the minus uh, value of m sub l. And now we have the green is the negative value of the wave function. It's, it's squared, so now it's a probability distribution. But before you squared it, psi was negative in this region, and it was positive in that region. That's all those colors are telling you, before you squared it. So same thing here. We, we do that so you can find the nodes. Where, where is a node? It's where the wave function changes from positive to negative. So if I didn't have positive and negative, you couldn't tell that the wave function went to 0 between them. The wave function, the only way to get from positive to negative is to pass through 0. So you have to know where it passes through 0. And what we have here is an angular node, a node that's shaped like a plane. And here, that's the zx plane. And here, it's the zy plane. No electron density. The wave function goes to 0 there. But the shape has this little dumbbell shape. It's p. There's one more value of m sub l. And that's pz. Now, I've done the same freaking darn thing. Uh, this. This little subscript here is the value of m sub l. But again, I changed from numbers to letters. There's, and there's no correspondence here. <laughs> it's mumbo jumbo. All you have to know here is there are three values of m sub l, minus 1, 0, and 1. So there are three p-type orbitals. There are three flavors of l0 because there's three m sub l's. And we call them px, py, pz. And you could have said this is uh, minus 1 for m sub l, plus 1 for m sub l. 
and zero for M sub L. But we give them the designations X, Y, Z instead. And I think you might see why. That tells us something about the orientation. It says that's oriented along the X axis. PY is oriented along the Y axis. And PZ is oriented along the Z axis. So those are handier designations than uh, 1, 0, minus 1. Don't have any geometric uh, information in them. OK? So let's look at them in a uh, demonstration here. So here, uh, let me get rid of all my drawings. Stay on me for a minute, then we'll go to this. Uh, what is happening here is I've, uh, I have displayed the 2S wave function. And you can see it's the wave function. It's oscillating back and forth. We can't show you the oscillation. You, you don't see it like a, a wave function. So what's changing is the color. It's going from red, highly positive, to zoom, blue, highly negative, and then back to red, highly positive. So that's oscillating. And you can see there's a node here where the wave function is 0, and then this inside, you can say, see, is oscillating positive to negative. So. Let's uh, let's stop it. Does it ever get to our combination of color? Uh, green and blue. That's kind of close. Oops, I can't stop it. I'll stop the simulation speed again so it stops going there. And you can see, oh, look, I stopped it at the right place. Green and red was the colors we were using for the sine of the wave function. Here, green and red, again, the sine of the wave function. How does it look on the webcast? You want to go just to the board so you can see just this? We'll go just to the board for a second. So now you don't see me. You just see the board. And I will annotate that again. So this is a node. And here, the sine of the wave function is, say, oh, we were saying negative. Negative. And here, the sine of the wave function is positive. That's not a charge. That's the sine of the wave function, OK, before I squared it. And again, we do it in colors because I can't draw it. I can't uh, draw that three-dimensional node very well, OK? OK, back on me. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, yeah, stay, stay on here. Let's just look at the Ps so that um, I can adjust. And, and these. Um, these, uh, these links, uh, for these simulations are in your notes so you can, you can see them. So here's the PZ axis and the PZ axis. So here's the Z axis and X is coming out of the board and Y is going that way. So PZ has this node of the XY plane where the wave function goes from positive to negative. OK, and that's just one of them. There's two others, one oriented along the y-axis and one oriented along the x-axis. OK, cool biz. Uh, since we're, uh, we'll stop there. We'll come back to this uh, later. Too many pictures. Now, I could go to n equal 3 then. And then I'd have three values of L. And the last one, L equal 2, we're going to use the letter D. So S, P, D are L equal 0, 1, and 2. And those are the orbitals uh, that we expect to see. L tells me the number of angular nodes. And N tells us the total nodes. And minus 1 tells us the total nodes. So there's two kinds of nodes, angular like we have here, and radial, like we saw in the s orbitals. The total is n minus 1. All the angulars, l tells you the number of angular nodes. 
And you can see how that would make a shape. If L is going to give you an angular node, that's going to give you an overall shape. Slice through something, and it changes a sphere into dumbbells. OK, so let's uh, talk through this one. No, let's, do, let's try to do this one. Uh, so scratch your head on this one. Get into your groups and uh, talk about this. So I'm going to plot psi in green and psi squared is going to be obvious. There it is, squared, versus this angle from the positive x-axis. So phi is the angle from the positive x-axis. And it's going to go from 0, the x-axis, all the way to 2 pi, all the way around in a circle, and come back to the x-axis. And there's a wave function there that it's sweeping through. As it sweeps through, it's sweeping through probability densities. The question is, which orbital is it sweeping through? Think about that for a second, and we'll take a vote. Let me go out here, Sophia.
Okay, guys, we can come back to me. Uh, this, especially this early in the morning, oh my God, we're way behind. Uh, this should have you scratching your head. Uh, this is hard stuff. You ju I just told you what fee was a second ago, and now I'm making you really apply it. So what was this thing fee? First, let's see what you're thinking. Think. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> Equal values for X, Y, and Z. I kind of expected that. This is super tough. And it, you'll be able to do this. Uh, go through this um, on your own. Uh, maybe sit quietly by yourself and uh, see what's going on. The, the key is, what is this thing fee anyway? Well, there it was. Fee is the angle from the positive x-axis. So as phi gets bigger, this, you sweep along the plane. I got it drawn here. So here's phi equals zero when you're right on the positive x-axis. Now I'm going to start sweeping towards positive y, and my values of phi are increasing until they get to 90 degrees. 90 degrees is pi over 2. And then I keep sweeping until I get to 180 degrees or pi. So let's watch it sweep through. So, but already I've drawn the 2py here. Already you can see 2py fits the bill because there's a node along the x axis for 2py. And, oh, I think it's in the animation. And there's a node in the wave function, there's a zero in the wave function there. Now I'm going to sweep out and I'm going to start, I get into this positive region here. I start touching this positive region and I keep sweeping and look, the value of the wave function increases. And if I keep sweeping all the way around to pi over two, that's right there in the middle. Oh, excuse me, right there at that peak, pi over two is right there and then keep sweeping all the way around to pi radians. Pi radians is there, and I'm at the node again, OK? And then I keep sweeping, and I start getting negative values of the wave function because I get to this region of the wave function. Psi squared, I still get, I'm, I'm getting the lobe. I'm getting the big lobe again. So this was a hard exercise about understanding basically what phi is. But I wanted you to geometrically think about these things and locate the nodes in terms of phi. Um, that's just a good exercise. Um, that question uh, for an arbitrary orbital would be maybe too hard for an exam question because it's so much thought. Uh, one that's just like this, that, that is, is like a P, then maybe you could think about. But I'm not going to give you something arbitrary, rotate phi or theta and, and figure out the orbital. That It, it just takes too much time uh, for an exam question. Fine for us. Okay, which has the most radial nodes? We'll talk through this uh, ourselves. Is it a 4F? Now, F, we didn't get all the way up to F. F is another value of L. So L, 0, 1, 2, 3. We have S, P, D, F. So F is L equal 3. 3, D. <clears throat> oh, and after that, it just goes alphabetically. F, G, H, I, J, K. Uh, and um, uh, so there's L equal 2. There's L equal 1. Which has the most radial nodes? There's two kinds of nodes. Radial, the circular ones, and angular, the planar ones. I don't know if you're interested. They're planar. They're called angular nodes because you fix one angle. Phi. Say phi equals zero. I'm going to fix phi equals zero. And let r and theta be everything else. So if phi is stuck at zero, that's the positive x-axis. r and theta can be anything. So they sweep out that plane the XZ plane.
That's why they're called angular. You fix an angle, theta or phi. Radial nodes, you fix R. And you say, R is going to be this long. Everything there is a node. And that's why you get those spherical noble surfaces, those radial surfaces. How many radial nodes? Uh, well, angular nodes. Uh, oh, the total nodes are given by n. So there's three nodes, n minus 1. There's two nodes and one node. The L is the number of angular. So here's zero. Zero angular nodes. S is L equals zero. Zero angular nodes. So there's one node, and it's not angular. <laughs> L is zero. So it's radial. Here, D is two. Two of the nodes are angular. There are two total, because n minus 1 is the total number. So both of the nodes are angular. F, L equals 3. Three angular nodes, but again, there are three total nodes, because n minus 1 is the total nodes. So even though these are high energy orbitals, these guys don't have any radial nodes. It's just that guy with a radial node. And we saw it. We looked at the 2s. That's what our picture was. Positive, zero, negative. That was radial node right in the middle of that uh, wave function. So let's just uh, review. How do we write down orbitals? We write the principal quantum level, and the principal quantum level just is a counting number, one, two, three, and n equal one is the lowest. There's an orbital associated with it, but I have to give you an L and an M sub L, and those have those designations, and now we know the letters S, P, D, and X, Y, Z, and when you look in your book, there's going to be other designations when you get to the Ds, X squared minus Y squared or uh, Z squared for the values of M sub L. No correlation. You don't have to know anything about how M sub L corresponds to some letter. As far as we know, all those letters are just telling us an orientation. It's, it's mathematics. It's a linear combination of orbitals to give you these things, but we don't care. We write the orbitals like this, N, L, sub, M sub L. So for N equals 1, all I have is L equals 0. So that's a 1S, and I only have one value of M sub L, 0. There's a designation there, the lowest. That's the ground state. And of course, for N equal 2, I can also have that combination. We have other combinations, but 0 and 0 are still OK at principal quantum level 3. Now I've taken them away, because the S is we don't write the 0 there, because it's the only value of m sub l you can have. So it's just in the way. Now I can be l equal 1. Can't do that for n equal 1, but I can do it for n equal 2. And then there's three values of m sub l. So there are three flavors of p orbitals because of the three values of m sub l. And again, we could write them 2p minus 1, 2p 0, and 2p plus 1. But we substitute letters now, and now we know the letters help us. They tell us where the orbitals are oriented, x, y, and z axis. So I'm just going to change those to x, y, and z. And we could do exactly the same thing at principal quantum level 3. And when I go to L equal 2, now I can have five values of m sub L, minus 2 to plus 2 in integer steps. And that would give me 5d orbitals. And I don't care too much about the d orbitals. Uh, some chemistry classes, they make you memorize names and shapes. I hate memorizing names and shapes. You know that. The d orbitals have shapes, and each one has a name. There's pictures in your book. That simulation, you can look at them. Um, I don't care. Uh, don't memorize them. Uh, look at them, and you can see the shapes. Maybe we'll look at them next time. But uh, we're going to deal 99.9% .9 of the time with S's and P's anyway. OK, lovely. 
One more quantum number. So now electrons get wacky again. It turns out if you shoot electrons through a magnetic field, then they uh, are deflected. And we know this. We saw it in mass spectroscopy. If you shoot something charged through a magnetic field, it uh, gets deflected. So uh, a charged electron going through, you'd expect it going through the magnetic field. It's asymmetric magnetic field. I've drawn it there to make it asymmetric. They would spread out based on uh, how fast they were going when they uh, got through there. It turns out there's another quantum mechanical thing that happens to the electron. On top of the fact that it's behaving as a wave, on top of that, there's another quantum mechanical thing. Because you, you shoot electrons through a magnet, and instead of giving you a broad distribution of all the different velocities, it gives you two spots. So it looks like the electrons are behaving like magnets, that they had an orientation. So they went through here, and the ones that had orientation magnet up got deflected here. The ones that had magnet down got deflected there, and that's the only kinds there were. There weren't other orientations of the magnet. So it looks like electrons behave like little magnets with two orientations. I wish we had time to talk about this because this is a blast. This is where class, where quantum mechanics really becomes fun. Uh, um, and, but it becomes much less intuitive. So you, you have to dive into the math. But the crazy thing is you dive into the math and it still predicts, it's still, now it's all mathematical, but it still predicts reality. All we're going to know is the electrons behave like this. They behave like little magnets. And we're going to say spin up and spin down. We say spin because a spinning electric charge would give you a magnetic charge, magnetic field. Shouldn't say magnetic charge. So any moving charge gives you a, a magnetic field. So if you're spinning this way, your magnet would point up. If you're spinning that way, your magnet would point down. Um, let me tell you that it's absolutely probably not the electrons. We can't localize in space anyway. They're not spinning. <laughs> well, who knows what they're doing? No one's ever seen one. Maybe no one ever will. They behave as if they did that. And uh, so that's just a, a thing we do for convenience to explain it to, to you guys. If we did the math, you'd say this Euler relationship and two overlapping wave functions, and you'd say, I can't do that. Spin, you get. So basically, all it does is uh, add another quantum number. And it's an easy one. It's either plus one half or minus one half, spinning up or spinning down. OK? So now we're going to write wave functions for each electron, but the wave functions are going to be described by n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. So four, now I told you every dimension gives you a quantum number. So how, how do we end up with four dimensions, four quantum numbers, if we only have three physical dimensions? Uh, well, there's another dimension you could consider, uh, the, say the time dimension. So the electron is here in this region of space with this probability at these times. So there's a famous rule, Pauli exclusion principle that says, Every electron in your atom has a different set of four quantum numbers. No electrons have the, exactly the same quantum numbers. So you can have the same n, l, and m sub l, but different values, plus 1 half and minus 1 half m sub s's. So we're going to write now, start writing the orbitals. And now I'm going to just start using lines very often. That line is the energy level of that orbital. And I'm going to put, to differentiate m sub s plus and m sub s minus 1 half, I'm going to use up and down arrows. So these are the individual electrons, one of them spinning up, one of them spinning down. And there's a couple ways I could do that. If you have energies that are exactly the same, so the same m, l, and m sub l, here's the two cases of that. So 
uh, here's uh, nL m sub l1, here's nL m sub l0. Uh, same energy, because n is the same. Uh, where do the electrons physically go? What's preferred? If you have all your energies the same, what do the electrons do? We are interested in what they do. So where do they occupy space and when do they occupy space? Well, Pauli exclusion principle just says this, that no two electrons will have the same quantum numbers. So I can't put another electron here because it would have to have spin up or spin down and we've already got all those covered. N, L, M sub L, M sub S, all covered there. Can't put another one there. I could do this for two electrons. That's fine. N, L, M sub L here, M sub L is different, so that's fine. But I could also have them spin parallel if I, if I uh, want. The question is, all these are fine. And if there are two electrons in your system, which would they prefer? Which set of quantum numbers would they prefer? And they do prefer one. They prefer that one. They prefer to use all the n's, l's, and m sub l's up with the same m sub s, and then go back and start using them up again with the other m sub s. Basically, it means they fill spin parallel first. Degenerate energy levels, I go all spin up or down. It doesn't matter, one of them. All spin parallel. And then when I'm out of equal energy orbitals, I go back and start putting the electron in with the opposite spin. So we have a couple principles now. We have this Aufbau principle, which is the energy levels are scaled by n. And I would put electrons in the lowest energy level first. And I have this Pauli principle that says they all have to have different total set of four. And then I have this Huns rule that says if the energies are equal, put them in parallel spin. There are other things. I'm not going to talk about that. So I can write then uh, electronic configurations now for. Uh, various atoms. Hydrogen, one electron. Hydrogen has all these energy levels. The electron can be in any one of those wave functions. But it, in the ground state, it's in its lowest energy wave function. If you give it some energy, it could be in the 3s. Absorb a photon. But that's high energy. Ground state is 1s. So you write that configuration like this. And we write 1s1 that says I'm in n equal 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0, and I have a spin uh, up in this case. That has a magnetism. That spin of the electron gives the whole atom a magnetism. OK, so the whole atom would deflect because it has an electron in spin up. If I go to helium, I put in. 1s and 1s1 and 1s2, I don't fill this one yet, 2s. Because even though I've drawn them on the same line just for clarity here, but the 2 is higher in energy. So I don't go there yet. I go my ground state and I put two electrons in it. And now those spins cancel each other, one spin up, one spin down. So the helium atom doesn't have a magnetism. It would go right through the magnetic field straight. Hydrogen would go. And either go half of them would go up and half of them would go down because it has an electron with a spin. Uh, and I can keep going. Now, lithium, I have the three electrons now. So one, two. And now I go to the next higher energy, 2s. And I put it in either up or down. Doesn't matter. And I write the configuration 1s2, 2s1. So this is the configuration of the electrons. It's telling you what orbitals, what wave functions are occupied. And I'll just go through this because I think it's obvious. I keep adding electrons. I have to go S here because 2P uh, um, I'll fill later. I'll show you why that is in the, in the uh, uh, next time. But I'll get to 
here, boron, where now I have five electrons, five positive charges, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. One electron in the 2p, four in the s's below that. And that has magnetism because it has at least one unpaired electron. Okay? Call them paramagnetic. Paramagnetic. They react to a magnetic field because of that spin. Okay, that's what we have. Uh, we have exam Monday. As you know, we will do material tomorrow, unfortunately, that's going to be on the exam. And then didn't, we did the review Monday. Uh, we'll do the review for the exam Monday. So study up everything that we do through the end of tomorrow. We'll be on the exam. And uh, we'll do a review Monday, give you some breathing room. And... Uh, We'll have the exam Monday night. All right. That's it. Uh, see you tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, over and out here from Berkeley.